Hi, I'm Leo, the uh, founder and CEO over at Graphistry, and I'm going to be talking today about Project Domino, which is uh, not even a Graphistry, but a community open citizen data science effort against COVID misinformation. And um, before we go into it, I do want to say thank you to um, the DEF CON staff, AI Village staff, um, and the Project Domino volunteers, um, and also uh, AI Village in particular, Sven. And this is a crazy time for all of us, and so to be able to put this together and um, a, a big thank you for that. I'm honored to be giving this as a, as a keynote. Um, I'm hoping folks here will benefit from uh, hearing what we've been learning and also um, if you are impacted um, somehow by COVID and want a, a way to give back, this, this might actually be a, a, a opportunity for you as well. With that, um, I wanna start with a kind of an example. This is about three months ago, might feel like three years for, for some of us. And uh, around the time when uh, the Seattle breakout was happening, our, our friends were kind of dealing with the hospital situations over there. Um, I think it was already like people were actually dying already in, in Seattle. Um, Governor Ke Kevin Stitt from Oklahoma posted this strange tweet, eating with my kids and all my fellow Oklahomans at the collective OKC, it's packed tonight, support local Oklahoma proud. Basically, and then he clarified in next day in a press release, um, we encourage uh, Oklahomans to go out to restaurants. Um, so for us, uh, with ties to the medical system, our, our head kind of was exploding. Like, like what, what's up? Um, fast forward uh, to a couple of weeks ago, um, and unfortunately um, for um, uh, Governor Kevin Stitt and his family, uh, he tested positive uh, for COVID. And unfortunately for his constituents who are relying on him, um, they have about a thousand per day infections at this point because kind of what we feared would happen is exactly what happens. Um, and now Oklahomans are dying. So it's, uh, um, I do want to do kind of um, some some disclosures and stuff in a bit, but to us, it's not about a left or right thing. It's like we're, you know, this is the medical health emergency. We need to do stuff. Uh, and, and that's um, uh, kind of a good note, like kind of where this project came from. Um, uh, we were kind of looking at uh, kind of what can we do? And there was this interesting statement by the, um, from the World Health Organization saying, we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. Um, and kind of the reasoning uh, that um, we kind of believe in here is until there's a medical cure, a pill, a vaccine, been tested, it's safe, uh, kind of the, the only thing we really have is behavior change. So we, um, and for that, uh, unfortunately, um, either need to get top-down policy enforcement or bottom-up uh, kind of citizen voluntary compliance. And unfortunately, we have folks standing in the way of that. And, you know, for Seattle, for Oklahoma, for all of us at home, uh, we're, we're seeing kind of the effects of, of failures to, to to win that fight. Uh, some quick disclosures here. Uh, we are gonna talk about real people. Um, we've published, uh, actually we haven't directly published, we, we published through partners. So we, we empower researchers to you through our tech. Um, so they published uh, on some of this stuff before and based on some of the results today, um, I expect to see some, some accounts going out and uh, hopefully some takedowns. Uh, likewise, uh, this is a volunteer organization, so the, the views expressed by uh, us, me, this talk, they're not necessarily representative of the uh, employers of the volunteers. Um, likewise, uh, you, you should expect um, some bias here. So a lot of us, um, actually some people on the team were even affected by COVID and then had their lives impacted by that. Family members do, their work, work life has been impacted. Misinformation is a, is a broader topic. Um, I'm just personally in a place, uh, some folks may remember, called the Soviet Union, where uh, prop propaganda was a thing and surveillance was a thing. So uh, conflicting thoughts on that. Um, but I do want to point out for on the team, I do especially want to call out some of the kind of uh, folks on the leadership team. Sean Griffin's um, been involved, involved in pandemic response. Uh, actually, he helped both the Obama and the Trump administration with um, pandemic planning. Um, Anita was over at the NSF um, and uh, looking a lot of digital crime, uh, blockchain, stuff like that. She's at UIUC now. And Cody Webb has been just kind of this um, like research powerhouse for our team and been researching misinformation for a while, for, forever. And I, I shared the names of some of the kind of uh, engineers helping uh, on, on our backbone. Um, the first example today will be uh, actually uh, Jeff Goldberg over at Social Forensics and David Knickerbocker, an independent researcher, have been uh, helping us a bunch on. And um, I think, oh yeah, and then tomorrow, 
if this is interesting to you, um, kind of the same types of stuff we're doing for, for COVID, uh, um, Andrea is going to be talking over at the biohacking village about imagine you're a cancer patient and, you know, you go to Facebook and then you just see all the same misinformation giving you false hope or, or the, and misguiding you. So it's important stuff. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about basically three things. First, I just want to take you down the rabbit hole through a, an example from uh, anti-vaccination misinformation. Second, I want to then give you more of a security data science perspective and how we're actually going about it, trying to figure out scale and auto response and all that stuff. And then uh, briefly, but incredibly important, um, why we're doing this as open citizen data science and why I'm actually pretty hopeful about uh, where this is going long term. And maybe this could kind of give you a chance or give you ways to, to kind of um, help out the community. Okay, so, so let's dive in. Um, so we were doing uh, an investigation and this name popped up, uh, Sherry Pen uh, Tenpenny, and we decided to see where we go for, for the purposes of this talk. Uh, and uh, for some folks, uh, if you're from Australia, this may be a familiar name. Uh, she's Twitter, uh, she's uh, Wikipedia famous uh, or infamous at this point. So uh, her um, 2015 lecture was canceled in Australia because apparently she uh, is involved in a lot of uh, vaccine misinformation and private organizations in Australia wanted no part of that. And so uh, they, they didn't support her. Um, for uh, our purpose and purposes, um, I do want to point out like um, there's kind of an ecosystem with different incentives here. And so if we look at somebody like um, Dr. Sherry, we see that uh, she does teach uh, courses, like hence the book tour. She sells books, she um, trains folks. She has about you know, 50, 60,000 followers on Twitter, not shown. She also has a big presence on Facebook um, and also on newsletters, so stuff that you don't even see. And uh, she gets paid to do it. Now it's kind of like her beliefs and her livelihood are the same thing. So she's very invested in this. Um, but uh, once we start looking at it, there, there are kind of a few things that looks a little strange. So um, she talks about Nazis in her um, profile. Like that's the first thing she, that's the first word um, she shows you. Um, and so that kind of, it's kind of like a whistle to, to one side of the house and then talks about abuses by the state. So that's kind of like a, a different kind of thing. And so um, it's kind of interesting to ask like who, like who's the community around her? So let's take a look. So um, what I did here is I uh, um, loaded in um, busy Dr. T. Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're looking at her and um, what we see in colors around her um, are basically, she's only following a couple hundred people, but she has 50,000 people following her. And so when we look at a sample of that, what we see up top is a, a bunch of folks, essentially public, um, basically anti-vax, um, um, natural medicine, a lot of kind of like medically minded folks that you'd sort of expect to, um, to be here. But then um, the surprise is, is once we start seeing the other colors. And so um, the, the tools here just kind of automatically colored and laid it out and everything like it's kind of just traditional graph analytics. So um, we see Donald Trump, we see um, Michelle Malkin, we see Candace. Um, basically, like in the dark green, we're seeing these public figures, um, kind of national conservative public figures. On the right, um, we were seeing, um, but a bit on the right, and then actually especially down here, um, we we're seeing um, a mixture of QAnon, which is a conspiracy group we're hearing about a lot nowadays. Um, we're seeing a lot of MAGA um, and Trump supporters, um, so not super surprising given we had Trump. And so it's kind of interesting that we have on the top, we have like, who do you expect with anti-vax, but on the bottom we have like the whole MAGA thing, we have conspiracy theories from QAnon, there are actually even like UFO stuff going on on the bottom. It's kind of like, an, like interesting to, to see that mix. Um, so I want to point out another phenomenon here. When we're looking at each community, like the question is like, how? Like, how are they interacting? Is it like they all really love our Dr. Busy T? Like, she just wrote this wonderful book. Um, what we actually see is like, for example, from the QAnon zone, they're they're reaching into the, the medical zone. Um, so they're following folks there. Conversely, if we pick somebody big in the um, kind of this top region, sometimes it's localized, but other times you see it's, it's, it's reaching into the, the QAnon zone. 
um, it kind of no matter which cluster I do, you're going to see those um, those reach outs. <coughs> Excuse me. So so that um, that's actually kind of um, strange. Um, where there's no reason to believe one conspiracy has anything to do with another. And so we're, we're actually kind of almost like in this other world. Um, and what we're seeing is the networks do cross over. Um, and so the first thing is what we're seeing is the question is why. Um, and that's basically to support influence. Um, sometimes that could be direct where you're just retweeting from each other's. Um, other times it might be to trick the Twitter algorithm. So for example, here, um, this is actually a Fox News reporter. So it's someone on TV. Um, they uh, they have 40,000 followers, which is reasonable for a um, personality, but they're following 30,000 people back. So that probably suggests an inauthentic um, and automatic action of following back somehow. We don't know what order they happened in, but in general, like that's prohibited by the Twitter's terms of service. But you know, they, they get clicks. And so uh, even though it violates terms of service, there they are. And that's basically the welcome to the VAX network, um, misinformation network. Um, and I realized that I, I glossed over this, um, but the reason we care about Dr. T and, and that she's talking about this stuff is the she and her community are already um, pushing messages against a COVID um, vaccine even though one hasn't even passed trials yet. So she's against it before it's even been tested, like just by principle. Um, and so Twitter has been supporting her in, in doing that essentially. And I'll get to that in a second. So I do want to uh, take a, a, one more, uh, I want to go a little bit deeper um, into our um, Dr. T. And so in particular, I want to understand the communities, like what, what they're doing. So here, what we're going to do and I want to see if there's kind of extra coordination structure. And so we're getting a bit more on the data science side. So what's going on here is we took the accounts. We actually took a look at about 100 million uh, COVID-related tweets to, to see if there's kind of organized behavior within it. Um, for each um, account, we just tried to look at for known sort of misinformation topics. What's sort of the signature? Like, you know, how many times did it like um, activate on different topics? And, and for... Uh, each account, we now have that sort of like uh, misinformation fingerprint, essentially. And then we ran something called uh, UMAP. Um, I think it's a universal manifold approximation or something like that, but basically tries to smooth out um, and assume structure behind that. And then uh, we, we took a look. So let's try it out. So yeah, so what's going on here is um, we're taking a look at um, those accounts um, and we only are showing from all the accounts we're looking at the 5,000 or so that um, we actually saw active across multiple um, misinformation topics. And um, so these are kind of the, the really the ones that are kind of that, that behavior going across topics, like are just like what's going on. Um, and uh, we, we ran UMAP, but then what we also did, you're seeing here, I'm drawing these little edges. Um, we also ran a, afterwards a K nearest neighbor, and I'll put them on screen, so that um, whenever we see accounts uh, kind of tweeting on similar topics and similar intensities, um, so it's really, for example, imagine two bots programmed to kind of talk about the same thing or controlled by the same person to kind of you know retweet someone else. Um, that's when we're going to draw that edge. And so, uh, again, they're not necessarily following. They're actually just on certain topics. They're actually pushing those topics in the same way. Um, so it's entirely content-based. And what and we're seeing here is uh, some interesting structure pops out um, for uh, across COVID Twitter. And then the second thing I, I did here is um, coloring. You're seeing some of these are a bit uh, um, pinkish. So if we jump, let's take a look at this one. So for this kind of group of, of activity, we're seeing a lot of this QAnon stuff. And so what I'm doing here is if in those tweets talking about COVID, they also talk about QAnon. Um, and we have a couple of words on that. We call that out too. Um, and so what we're seeing is like, you know, for this general topic, a bunch of accounts never explicitly mention QAnon, but it's definitely, maybe it's like two coordinators or, or who knows, or like something like that. But it, we're actually seeing uh, a lot of QAnon influence uh, across these different uh, organized uh, groups. And actually, in particular, almost all of these have a bit of QAnon. Um, so you're seeing it's not all white, it's all a little off-white. And then what's more, uh, you're seeing some of them are, you're seeing these pockets of heaviness. When we uh, calculated it out, it's about 15% of these accounts uh, spread throughout our, our QAnon. And so at least for COVID Twitter, 
that that was actually kind of interesting, and uh, for us, that was a surprise. Um, so that that kind of put put QN on in terms of medical misinformation on on our radar. Uh, so that's not good. Okay, so uh, jumping ahead. Uh, so okay, so we're looking at our our busy Doctor T, um, and. Uh, clearly blatant activity going on here. The last thing I wanted to point out was uh, then we look on the right here and Twitter's saying, hey, you should probably, now that you're here, you should also check out this uh, Judy, uh, Judy Mikovits, um, this PhD. Sounds authentic, right? Sounds smart. You may have also known about this uh, uh, Judy as a uh, some video going around called Plandemic, which uh, you know got pulled down as a pretty bad misinformation. Uh, and so, so that was pretty shocking to, to see, like, I was like, oh, that name sounds familiar. So that, that was a little crazy. That was like the number one recommendation of Twitter. As soon as you go to this webpage, it's to learn about Plandemic. So, um, and this is like, you know, way after the fact. And so kind of in summary, what we're seeing in this, uh, in this basic, pretty basic, honestly, analysis, very blatant um, anti-vaccine um, uh, misinformation, a lot of it about COVID in particular. We're seeing it's it's not just anti-vaxxers, but we're actually seeing a lot of cross uh, mis, uh, cross community support by misinformers. It's it's pretty blatant. It's also it's pretty um, pretty obvious how they abuse uh, like the very few terms of service Twitter does have. So it's, that's a little strange. Um, it is uh, a little disappointing to see um, uh, Fox, um, the Republican Party, uh, MAGA, um, and a lot of them kind of involved in this uh, anti-medical misinformation and again tab is so blatant um, and then on the platform side uh, it's um, when we saw that overlap and like oh wait a minute Twitter makes money off of some of this stuff it, they're clearly looking the other way for the terms of service violation and then like what was the 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 pandemic promotion just that was just that blew my mind so um, this is not uh, this is not a healthy uh, situation. Um, so from a data perspective, um, uh, or actually security uh, analytics perspective, I do want to step back. Uh, if we think about uh, attackers defenders, ultimately the targets are um, individuals and organizations um, going on a radicalization journey. Um, and so every time Twitter recommends you do another crazy thing that, that just takes you um, deep, uh, deeper. Um, Interesting extra level on the threat model here is that folks are essentially um, influenced uh, based on their life conditions. So maybe they're going through a hard time. Maybe they're elderly and don't really know what's going on. And also by their community. You know, if you're if your pastor or somebody um, or your family friends tells you something, you're more inclined to believe it. Um, and so being able to infect communities with this stuff is uh, and show, having mastery over that and, and platform level support is not good. Um, for actors, it's a lot of um, uh, what you'd expect. Uh, I think that the surprising thing for, for threat actors here is uh, we actually consider the at this point the um, the platforms to be part of the uh, the threat. Um, in particular, we we break down the platforms as the social network system. So um, Facebook owns a bunch of uh, social network. Google owns a bunch of social networks. A few are just big on their own, right? Like Reddit, Reddit and Twitter. Um, and you know, Twitter is a multi-billion dollar profitable company, but here we are. A um, little less obvious to folks is messaging. Um, and again, actually a lot of the same companies like uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, Yahoo um, uh, own essentially the messaging channels. Those are completely unmonitored. Um, and so a lot of times the radicalization actually hops over to newsletters. Um, so that's stuff basically dark data. Um, and also, uh, uh, the, uh, local news, uh, think like Fox, um, and, and folks like that, um, a little surprising is, uh, there's kind of a monopoly effect where, because you do have regional, uh, different ways of having monopolies on people's attention. Um, that's all the reason these companies got so big, uh, same reason we're basically at the whimsy of, of these companies. And so when you kind of calculate it out, like the 80% essentially is just about 13 of these groups. Um, and. So we're, if we have a fickle Silicon Valley CEO, if we have employees who just go along for the ride, if we have advertisers who keep feeding them money, um, you know, uh, so that, that's kind of the, from the threat model perspective, um, shifting gears a bit to more like kind of, uh, data, like security, data engineering, data science, 
in order to do the data science, I did want to talk a little bit about this. Um, we end up having to, to build a lot to, to work at um, kind of the, the speeds and scales we're targeting. So if you want to have an instant response pipeline, that means you have to kind of have streaming. You know, can you take hundreds or thousands of things a second? So our V1, you're kind of seeing the performance of that. Um, we are architecting to a V2 so that we can actually go to arbitrary scale, um, just have it essentially budget limited. Um, you are noticing we're doing a lot of graph technology. And so basically uh, that's a nice way to deal with a lot of heterogeneous data and a lot of like link linkage of data. Um, even actually in a machine learning world where instead of just direct links, you might have vectors, um, feature vectors. Two other interesting things about the stack I did want to point out here. Uh, one is we do do end-to-end -end GPU computing just to be able to, you know, you can actually, if you want to have a billion node graph in, in memory, you actually could do that stuff with, for example, the Rapids AI stack. Likewise, uh, neural nets uh, in this space, uh, uh, graph neural nets are getting interesting. Um, we actually do more today on the traditional ones, but um, we're, we're looking at those. And the last part, and I think most important, is kind of division of team. We have basically heroes for data engineers, and then um, a big part of this is figuring out ways to get out of the way, just given it is a, an, open, an open volunteer effort. And so we actually do a lot on the self-service, um, and that's a big theme for look about powering. So think notebooks, uh, streamlit dashboards, um, uh, uh, graphics to redo, uh, visual analytics, and automatic ML, just level, increasing the ability of people just to go and, and handle this stuff. Um, as a, from the data science side, I kind of wanted a fun example here. Um, for example, uh, we had a, a news organization ask us about Obamagate. And so uh, one of our analysts, Cody, did a good job of using basically a hashtag analysis to basically connect the dots to about a month back to uh, some uh, QAnon stuff. And it was kind of impressive because uh, the Trump tweet made no sense at all, like even when I read it today, um, all these kind of code words. But um, once we move to uh, more modern NLP t techniques and go away from exact, you know, uh, match of, of terms. So um, Cody correctly had to look for Obamagate, but with NLP, we can now do things like, well, let's just look for the word Obama and the word conspiracy, but actually not the word, but the top, just the fuzzy topic. And, and when you have those things, then we could kind of uh, more loosely um, kind of walk back. Uh, and so that means we can do kind of traditional analysis more easily. And so we've been building out a, a lot around that. Um, I want to point out um, um, FICE indexing from, from uh, Facebook and BERT modeling from basically what everyone does now. Um, and then the other uh, thing I want to point out here is this is also opening up types of analysis that just were straight up like you couldn't even think about. Um, so uh, maybe one example could be um, for looking at masks in a community where you might ask like who which messages are against mask use that's kind of a strange that's kind of a gets into uh, semantics and meaning a bit and that's hard to do just by by keywords um, and then could, could you summarize it could we actually have a demographic breakdown there are just certain things that with traditional NLP, you couldn't have done, but over the years, uh, over the last like five years, and actually even two years, uh, it's just been really nuts what's been going on. Um, then, kind of the last piece I'm gonna I'm gonna share here is kind of just where we are, where we're going. You, you're kind of getting a sense that we can now, you know, bring in a research a researcher on a topic, and um, if we have the data, or, or we help them pull in the data and kind of do this kind of analysis. Next level of empowerment we're looking at is like as we're building this out is can we actually partner with less technical organizations and if we have to kind of do this to protect their community. Imagine like a local civic leader. I was talking about the um, cancer community with Andrea with uh, kind of at risk patients. And there we're looking at can we start helping them to kind of figure out is it, are there folks who are not even maliciously misinforming in their community, but people are just confused or are there people kind of targeting them? Can we start mapping out and, and building tools and stuff around that? Um, so uh, that's kind of the phase shift we're starting to go into. So that's pretty pretty exciting. Um, you're kind of seeing as you build out that state of capability, all this stuff unlocks. And then um, finally, I, I just kind of want to close out and tie together some of the stuff here. So the beginning, I was, I was kind of sharing that investigation. Hopefully, what you got across is like, yeah, like the analysis is cool, and we're able to like you know do these giant analyses, but it, like ultimately a lot of the important stuff is so in your face and so huge numbers that like, again, that analogy of fishing with dynamite. Um, and it's, you know, those 13 companies that like, 
you know, they shouldn't be gifting essentially millions or billions of dollars in free uh, targeted ads to, uh, to to these groups and targeted recommendations. Um, it's kind of that stuff that I think is more systemic. Um, I am disappointed to see uh, kind of these le otherwise legitimate groups appear to be corrupted by misinformation. So call out, essentially we're seeing MAGA is just so ever present here. Um, we're seeing social media companies, regular media companies. So there are things you could do if you're an employee, um, if you are anywhere near the advertising spend of your of your company, all that stuff's important. Um, and then, kind of turning it around, uh, that's that's all kind of social policy. Uh, a lot of folks tuning in are um, technologists of different stripe. And the bad news is we're seeing these these monop mon monopolistic media companies are, are not able to self-regulate. Like the left hand and the right hand are always at each other and it's, it's kind of brought us to where we are. Likewise, um, they've kind of gutted um, investigative um, and jur journalist teams uh, like just because their ad, ad companies sucked all the money. And likewise, we're seeing private companies are sort of compromised as they're kind of trying to deal with revenue. So that's bad. Um, what's good is uh, we actually have an open source community. Uh, we, I mean, just like the technology community, um, that is huge. Um, and now at the same time, data science is, you know, our Python that's almost like built into the DNA. So uh, I see strong potential and gathering potential for that. Um, I encourage that. Uh, you're seeing some of it happen here with Project Domino. And so on, on that point, um, if you are into this kind of stuff and you could help out with coding, um, just head into our Slack. Um, likewise, as we launch um, in the in the coming months, these kind of uh, more self-serve and tiers for folks sitting on top, um, reach out for partnering. And likewise, uh, um, while we are looking at doing sustainable approaches to our growth, uh, any like in, especially as sort of a, um, a bootstrap phase that we're in for the next year or so. Um, we're definitely, you know, grants, whatever, that, that stuff does help uh, with the core team do what they need to do. Likewise, you know, uh, serverless compute time, anything like that. With that, um, thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully this changed a little bit about either how misinformation is working in practice um, in um, the COVID era, and also even more importantly, that we actually could do things and we actually detect it and then we can actually build tools for it. So, thank you.